morning, we are going to bring to a conclusion our 40 Days in the Word series. How many of you have enjoyed this journey up to this point? Well, it's not over. This is, this is just the beginning. It's been an awesome uh, experience to see how God is stirring up a new hunger, a new passion, a new commitment to God's Word in this community we call Word of Grace. I believe as a result, God is going to multiply in us, individually and collectively, His power, His purposes, His promises uh, in a dynamic way. For this has been a time for us to shrink our excuses, to shrink our buts, so to speak, and to enlarge our willingness to be available to be used by God for His purposes and His plans. Somebody suggested that uh, we ought to have what has been referred to as a no-excuse Sunday. Perhaps you've heard this before. To make it possible for everyone to attend church next Sunday, we're going to have a special no-excuse Sunday. Wouldn't that be awesome? Cots will be placed in the foyer for those who say Sunday is my only day to sleep. We'll have still helmets for those who say the roof will definitely cave in if I ever come to church. Blankets will be furnished for those who think the church is too cold, fans for those who think that the church is too hot. We will have hearing aids for those who think the preacher speaks too softly, cotton for those who think he preaches too loudly, and who definitely think that the music is too loud. Scorecards will be available for those who wish to list all the hypocrites uh, hypocrites present. Some relatives will be in attendance for those who like to go visiting on Sunday. There will be TV dinners for those who can't go to church and cook dinner also on the same day. One section will be devoted to trees and grass for those who like to see God in nature. This is one of those days, church, isn't it? Finally, the sanctuary will be decorated with both Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who have never seen the church without them. (laughs) Seriously, next Sunday, we're not going to have a no-excuse Sunday because every Sunday should be a no-excuse Sunday. Amen? Amen? Next Sunday, we are actually starting a new message series that we are calling Limitless. And we're going to talk about overcoming the labels that people in the world and the forces of darkness put on us to limit our potential in Christ. And I want to say to you this morning, church, that that our culture is filled, the church is filled with people walking around with labels that have been put on them that are limiting the power of Christ, the destiny of Christ in their lives, labels like fear and inadequacy, and loneliness, and rejection. we got a whole list that we're going to be talking about in the month of November. And how many of you know that, that you are more than your past when God holds in His hands your future? How many of you believe that this morning? That's going to be the focus of our Limitless series. We're going to talk about how to discover tapping into the unlimited power that God has for us, how to cast off those labels and to walk in the fullness of the purpose and the plan that God has for our lives. And that truly becomes a reality for you and I when we learn to integrate His Word into our lives and allow the Holy Spirit to instruct us and to teach us. Kind of reminds me of the story of a police officer who pulled the driver aside and asked for his license and registration Uh, What's wrong, officer, the driver asked. I didn't go through any red lights. I certainly wasn't speeding, to which the officer responded, no, you weren't, but I saw you waving your fist as you swerved around that lady on the left lane. I further observed your flushed and angry face as you shouted at the driver, the Hummer who cut you off, how you pounded your steering wheel when you came to a stop near the bridge. Is that a crime, officer? The man asked, no, but when I saw that Jesus loves you and so do I bumper sticker on your car, I figured this car had to be stolen. (laughs) In other words, the officer was saying, your faith, the word of God, is supposed to be integrated into your life. The opposite of integrated 
or the word integrate is to segregate. To segregate is to separate into groups. When you segment your life, you live a segregated life. When you take the pieces of a pie, and surely we're entering into pie season. How many of you love pie this morning? Okay, just stop over Patterson's. They got some pretty amazing pies. But if we do life like a pie and we say, this is my personal life and this is my church life and this is my business life and this is my home life and here's my social life and you segment your life and you live a segregated life. Isn't that true? You don't have an integrated life, which means that there's an absence of integrity because the word integrity comes from the word integrate. To have integrity means to live your life integrated as a whole. You don't act one way with a group of people over here, another way with a group of people over there. That's what the Apostle Paul accused Peter of. When he was with the Gentiles, he would act a certain way, and then when he was with the Jews, he'd act completely different. And he'd kind of blend in with the different customs, but it was not necessarily a positive way. To act the same in all areas of life as a whole means to live an integrated life, a life of integrity. How does that happen? Well, I can confidently say this. It's not going to happen if you don't have the desire and the resolve and the commitment to really learn the Word of God, to embrace the Word of God, to make it a part of your life, and then to intentionally apply it to your life. It doesn't happen by chance. This book is not going to get absorbed into your mind and your spirit. It's not going to become a part of your life. You're never going to have the opportunity, occasion to really act on it, to adjust your life along the way, because this book calls us Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, that's like a high impossible standard. Unless you understand that when Jesus used the word perfect, he wasn't referring to absolute perfection, was he? No, the the Greek and the Hebrew words for perfection, when he makes that reference, particularly the Greek word, refers to adjusting and repairing. We are continually adjusting and repairing along the way in our journey as we are becoming more like Christ. Now, we can deal with that, right? That's a little bit easier to embrace and to absorb into our lives. And so it becomes a a, a mission of of integration. It becomes an issue of having the desire. If we're ever going to be men and women of the Word, we have to really make a resolved commitment based on desire to apply Scripture to our lives. Psalms 119.20 says, What I want most of all... David speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's expressing his desire here when he says that. What I want most of all, what I want to be the number one priority in my life, he says at all times, that means it's integrated. Not just in certain times or on the first day of the week on Sunday or occasionally, but he says at all times, not just at church, is to honor your laws. David was saying, I want to be a man of the word. And I want to be a man of the word every day of the week with the understanding, yeah, we're going to miss the mark. David missed the mark, but he came back and he he realigned and readjusted. He adjusted and repaired along the way with God's help and his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy and his love. Why? Because you know what, church, every one of us here today, we are a work in progress. We are on a journey. We are adjusting, repairing, realigning, reconnecting to God's purpose and his plan for our lives. We need to teach our our children and our children's children to do the same. That if you make a mistake, that doesn't mean that God's going to cut you off once and for all. You know, no, he wants to to pick us back up. We need to teach our children how to get back up. It's not about whether you're going to fall. It's about whether you're going to know how to bounce back and get back up again, to get back into that race that we've been talking about in weeks past. How do you do that? Well, actually, what we've been doing over the last uh, five weeks and now into our sixth week is we've been looking at five principles, now six today we're going to look at, six principles based on six memory verses They give us the six steps in how to integrate God's word into our lives. Those memory verses were not just kind of chosen by happenstance, not randomly. Each one of those gives us a 
a revelation to a step in the process of how to integrate God's word into our lives. So let's just kind of rehearse those. That's what I want to do today. We're going to just kind of highlight those. First of all, we learn that we need to build our lives on God's word. That's the first step in the process of integrating his word into our lives. In other words, we need to learn to make the Bible the foundation of our lives. Whatever the foundation is will determine how big the structure is on top of it. So we have to learn how to spiritually If we're going to build a spiritual house, how to build our lives on the foundation of God's word. That is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7, in the famous Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, 24, he said, whoever hears these words of mine, one of our memory verses, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Verses in the context of the story, the man or the woman who builds their house upon a rock. The sand that shifts and moves and has no stability. That's one of the memory verses. He's saying build your life on sand or build your life on the rock. If you build your life on the rock of truth, you do it with the understanding that truth never changes. The truth of his word, because it's eternal in nature, never changes. It doesn't shift with popular opinion, or what happens in popular culture. If you build your life upon that, and it changes, where does that leave you in the time of difficulty, in the time of crisis? You need to say, first off, God, I'm going to build my life on this book, on your word as my sure Foundation. In fact, there are times when I don't even feel like building my life on your word. But I'm going to do it anyway, by choice, as an act of faith. I'm going to do it consistently. I'm going to do it regularly. I'm going to do it as a declaration of my faith because I believe that there is great power in your word. And it's through your word that We can do exceedingly, God, abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that is working in us as the Spirit takes that word and he quickens it in our lives. Most people in our culture build their lives on shifting foundations. And when difficulty and hardship and storms come, what happens? The foundation is shaken and their lives are are devastated. Some examples, popular culture, you know, what's in, what's out? Well, guess what? Whatever's in is eventually going to be out, isn't it? And if you're building your life upon that, you know, what's cool, what's fashionable, what's popular, guess what? It's going to become one day unpopular. It's going to become unfashionable. It's going to become uncool. And if you've invested your life into that, and you've built your life upon those shifting perspectives, guess what? You'll have no stability, no staying power. How about tradition? Tradition. A lot of people build their lives on tradition, and we know that there are good traditions. The reason traditions are established is because something good has happened, and we want to see that reproduced. But guess what? Traditions are not eternal. Only the truth of the word of God is eternal. Traditions become obsolete, don't they, over time. We can't always do things a certain way because we did them in the past. In fact, if we're not careful, we will memorialize those things and we will bring them and lift them and elevate them to the level of the standard of God's truth. And that's the very thing that Jesus came out strongly against in the lives of the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees. He said, listen, you guys have taken the traditions of men that you have created, and you preach them and teach them as the commandments of God. And because of that, you are in error. You have led my people astray. You are self-deceived. Why? Because only the truth of the word of God will endure forever. How about reason? Reason is a gift from God, and and we 
We follow reason and we make reasonable choices and decisions because God gave that to us as part of our equipment uh, in the natural and spiritually speaking. Reason is reasonable. But there are times when you think what is reasonable is not actually right when it comes to spiritual matters. Well, I've always thought, well, guess what? It really doesn't matter what you've always thought. What matters is what is the right thing to do in this situation based on the truth of God's word and the the direction of God's spirit as he's leading and guiding you. When we rely strictly on our own intellect, you know what happens? We end up making mistakes along the way in our journey. How many of you have ever done that before? You thought this was the reasonable thing to do and you missed it completely, you know? You started that business prematurely, or you overcommitted financially. You pulled the trigger too early, or you pulled the trigger too late, right? Because you were following the path of, of reason. Proverbs 16, 25 says, there's a way that seems right to man, seems like the right thing to do, but in the end, and how many of you know it's a dead end, he says it leads to death. What's important? What's important is that we listen to and we are open to the counsel of God's Word and the Holy Spirit when God is talking to us and when God is speaking to us and sometimes even asking us to do things that don't make any sense. Church, I want to tell you, when God told Moses to send the 12 spies into the promised land and they came back. And they had two different reports. The 10 spies who came back with what with the scripture refers to as an evil report of unbelief, they came back with a reasonable report. You have to understand that they said, listen, there are giants in the land. We're no match for them. That was true in the natural. There are cities that you cannot believe how they're fortified. We're not equipped to take those cities. Absolutely right. But you know what? There's a difference, church, between reason and revelation. Revelation supersedes reason at different times and seasons in our lives. Joshua and Caleb, they had the revelation. They knew the promise that God had given, that God was not only capable of delivering on the promise, but he was going to do it in that moment. Joshua and Caleb stood up before the people at that great town meeting they had and said, listen, you know what? These guys are wrong. They're speaking out of reason, not revelation. God said, this is a good land. I've given you this land. They said, listen, we're able to take the land. But that evil report of unbelief, it just swept through the congregation. And and it overtook the promise. It overtook the revelation of what God wanted to do. Why? Because in that moment, reason was not the pathway to follow. They said, yeah. Joshua and Caleb said, yeah. Yeah. There's giants in the land. The cities are fortified. But guess what? God is able to deliver us out of their hands. Because they saw it. By faith, they saw that promise becoming a reality. And sometimes God asks us to do things that don't make sense. That don't follow the path of reason. And when you've got that word and it's clear, and it better be clear because if it's not, you're acting out of foolishness and presumption. And you'll suffer that consequence. But when you got the word of God and it's clear and it's sure and it's confirmed and you step out in faith, you're not doing it based on reason. You're doing it based on revelation. That's what Esther did when she broke protocol. Esther should have been put to death when she showed up in the presence of the king unannounced. Because you had to be invited or it would have cost you your life. But she knew that God was doing something, and she took a step of faith based not on reason but on revelation, and she saved an entire nation. She saved her people because she took that step of faith, church. How about the centurion soldier in the New Testament? Jesus said to the centurion soldier, I'm going to come to your house, and I'm going to pray for your servant who is sick. That's the reasonable pathway, and we're going to do a miracle. What do the centurions say? No, Lord, you don't have to come to my house. Why? Because he had a revelation. God wants to give you a revelation that he's got something better than what you're experiencing right now. God's got something better for your future. And some of you, you come here and you've settled 
for mediocrity. You've settled for second best. And he has a bigger and a greater revelation for your future. Despite what has happened in the past, despite what the current circumstances are, he wants to take you higher and farther than you've ever gone. You can't get there, church, by reason. You only get there by revelation. And that doesn't mean that we throw out reason and common sense because that's a gift. But there comes a time in the journey when you have to listen to God's word and you have to listen to the revelation and allow the promises to speak to you. The centurion soldier said, listen, Lord, I'm a man under authority. There's the revelation. I'm a man under authority. You speak the word. You speak the word because when I speak the word and I say to my servants, you go here and you go there, they go because they're under authority. I'm under the authority of your word. That's a revelation. Say the word. Only say the word. And my servant will be healed. And the scripture says that Jesus was absolutely captured in that moment. He was blown away. He was astonished to the extent that he said to the whole crowd that gathered, I have not found this kind of faith in all of Israel. The people that I came to, none of them have demonstrated. This is a Gentile speaking. He's a, he's a non-believer, so to speak. What are we talking about? What you're building your house upon. The revelation of God's word is a sure foundation, one that we stand upon. People are building their houses upon popular culture and and tradition and reason, and sometimes even emotion. Some people build their lives simply on emotion, on feeling. If it feels right, I do it. If it feels wrong, I don't do it. Kind of runs consistent with the popular line from the song we've all heard from the 70s. It can't be wrong when it feels so right. Anybody remember that? If you go back that far. There's a problem with that. Feelings can lie to us. In fact, they lie more often than not. Sometimes you feel like things are going great, and guess what? They're not. Other times you feel like the, the, the whole world is caving in, and you know what? Things are actually going pretty well, and something big is about to happen, and you're this close, and you don't realize it. You're that close to to a breakthrough happening. We have to be careful how unreliable feelings can be. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we see, what we feel, what we are experiencing in the emotional realm of our lives. If you're not careful, feelings will, will manipulate you and manipulate your moods. And if you're driven by your moods, you surely are being manipulated. And if you're building your life simply on emotion, there's a word that we use for that. It's the word immaturity. Immature people, immature Christians live their lives by their emotions and their feelings and their moods. We live first by faith, secondly by sight. We act out of faith, not out of feelings, not out of emotion. The Bible tells us in Judges 21, like about 5,000 years ago, that there was a time where Israel had no king. And the scripture says in Judges 21 that, that people did whatever they felt like doing and whatever was right in their own eyes at the moment. Feelings are fickle. They will change. And as a result, your moods change. And if your decision-making capacity is tied into your feelings and your moods, you're going to make bad choices and decisions. What are we talking about? Building our lives on shifting sand, popular culture, tradition, reason, emotion. God said if you build your word on, or your life on my word, it will be a strong foundation. If that's the the groundwork that is being laid, then you'll learn how to feed on my word. That was a, another major step in the process uh, that we talked about. Step number two is feeding on the word of God, Colossians 3.16. Do you remember the memory verse? Let the, the word of Christ richly dwell in us. 
That scripture and that promise is about feeding and learning how to feed on God's word. The word literally means there in the phrase when he talks about the word of, of Christ dwelling in us richly. It literally means and is translated, let it move into you. Let it inhabit you. Take up residence in a rich, profound, and life-giving way. That's what this verse is speaking to us. It's basically saying just as physical food is to your physical body, the word of God is spiritual food to your soul and to your heart and to the spiritual dimension of your life. In fact, the scripture uses all kinds of different word pictures from the natural to help us understand how important this word is to us in our hearts and our spirits. Uh, Words like water and milk and bread and the meat of spiritual life and living. And just as you feed your physical body and nourish your physical body, Through proper diet and exercise, we need that same dynamic happening in our lives spiritually in order for us to be able to go the distance and to overcome the challenges and the obstacles that life brings our way. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God himself. So if you are a construction director or a contractor, you know, who among us would send out a worker without having eaten for a week or two? Who would send out a manager or a director on an assignment for an extended period of time without having the proper resources needed to provide the nourishment necessary, especially for physical labor? Yet, how often do we do that in our spiritual lives? That's why it's so important for you to be a part of a of a Bible-believing church, a church that is based and built upon the Word of God. Otherwise, you're not going to have the nourishment for the soul that you need. And one of the excuses that Christians use from, from jumping from one church to another church to another church is that they're saying, I'm just simply not being fed. In church, you know what? That's really not a very good legitimate reason unless you're really in a church that is spiritually dead. And I realize there are spiritually dead churches. But there are a lot of churches out there that are teaching the Word of God. If you are depending upon drawing on all the resources you need in a given week based on what you're getting here on Sunday morning, I'm telling you, it's not enough. you got to have a personal, devotional experience, an encounter with God on a regular basis through the week in order for you to have the strength and the sustenance you need and the perspectives and the resources you need to be able to go the distance and to be victorious. We've talked about in our small groups, we talked about how that in order for that to happen, God wants to engage all of our ins- all of our five senses. That's how we absorb and we feed upon God's word and we get it on the inside of us. We receive it with our ears, right? We listen uh, with our ears. We read it with our eyes. We research it with our hands and our mouth. Through study, we talked about that. Uh, We reflect on it with our minds. We remember it with our hearts because that's where the internalization process takes place. We actually build it into our spirit. It becomes a part of of our inner spirit. Why? Because God wants to use all five of our senses in order to help us to feed on on the Word of God. And it's through our five senses that we learn to build our lives upon it, we learn to feed on it, and then we learn to live by it. That was another major step in the process, is learning how to live according to the standard of God's Word. See, because the Word of God is not only food for our souls, but it's the standard that we live by. So we refer to this in theology as the doctrine of authority, kind of going back to the centurion soldier. What is the highest standard of faith and practice for our lives? that we are governing our choices and our decisions and our lifestyle according to? Is it according to your feelings? Is it according to somebody's opinion? Is it according to something outside of ourselves? See, the doctrine of authority in relationship to Scripture says that the Word of God exists outside of ourselves objectively, not subjectively, opinions, Feelings, emotions are subjective, aren't they? Right? Feels good, has to be right. The Word of God is not governed by any of those external dynamics. The Word of God stands alone. 
objectively outside of ourselves is the highest standard of faith and practice for how we ought to live our lives. Amen? Do you believe that this morning, church? Then that's why you're involved in 40 Days in the World, because you believe that that, that, that standard, when it's internalized, will govern the way that you live your life and how you relate to people in, in, your, in your family and outside of the family, in the workplace, in the community, how it directs your life past, present, and future. We're talking about learning to live by the Word of God. Psalms chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man, the woman, who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scorner. But his delight, her delight is what? In the law of the Lord. And it's in the law of the Lord that they meditate day and night. And he said, they will become like a tree that is planted by a river of water that brings forth fruit in its season. Whatever it does, whatever they do, because of that, will prosper. What are we talking about? He's painting a picture of the individuals who, who are living the Word of God as that highest standard of faith and practice. And the key word here is the word meditation. If you want to bless life, if you want God to bring increase, if you want God to prosper what you're doing, then you've got to learn how to meditate in the Word of God. So here's the memory verse that we learned along the way out of Psalms 119.11. It says, I've hidden your word in my heart, Lord, so that I might not sin against you. Because when the Word of God is deposited in our spirit, then the Holy Spirit, in the moment of decision, in the moment of pressure, in the moment of temptation, in the moment of challenge, He's searching the banks of your mind in your heart. He's looking for something to draw on to help you to make a decision. And when he finds the word of God, that's what happened to Jesus, didn't it? When he was in the wilderness, Jesus had something on the inside of him for the spirit to draw on in the moment of weakness and vulnerability and temptation. And it became a tremendous source of of power for him. Three different temptations were brought to him strategically by by Satan in vulnerable moments as he was fasting and praying in the wilderness. Each time Jesus responded, he didn't have a written scripture with him in that moment. Most of the time you run into challenges and temptations and difficulties, guess what? You're not holding your Bible, are you? No, it's got to be in you. Jesus said, it is written. Satan came and he says, it is written is written. You're the son of God. Throw yourself off of the cliff. The angels will save you. It is written. He spoke the word because the word was in him. He had deposited and built the word into his spirit. So we're talking about Ryan and Melissa coming from London and living there for the last five or six years. I was in London about five years ago and And of course, for those of you who have been to England, you know that the English love their tea. I mean, it was just an art form to watch. We stayed in a woman's home that hosted us, and I spoke in uh, Gary Spicer's church, and Gary has been here before. We hope to have Gary come and speak again in the future. Uh, And uh, it's just an art form to watch them prepare tea for breakfast. And I like particularly English tea. You know, there's different kinds of tea. I like the English tea. But, you know, of course, here in America, you kind of just boil the water and you throw the tea bag in, right? Well, that's, that's not right. That's not the proper way to make tea, right? You've got to boil the water for a certain period of time. It has to reach a certain level of intensity, and you have to put the tea bag in just at the right time, and the tea bag has to stay in for only a certain period of time to be able to bring out the aroma and the flavor that is appropriate in order to maximize the enjoyment of that tea, Right? You know what, church, that's like you and I with the Word of God. You know, when God, when God puts us into that, to the, to the water of the Word, right, you know what happens? We get changed. We get transformed. You know, we get, we get, we get a transformation, and we come out looking different, don't we? We come out transformed, um, and there is the aroma, and there is the flavor of of the presence of God and the power of God being expressed in our lives. Because when we are living it and it's our highest standard of faith and practice, then we can start to grow through it. We can grow through the Word of God and it actually begins to to change 
the way that we are communicating, living, and the way that we are acting in our lives. That's why David said in Psalms 119, verse 18, growing through it is a, another step. He said, open my eyes and I may see wondrous things in your law. There's amazing things in the Word of God that you and I have never seen about our lives because we've not yet had the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes. It's about, it's about us growing through the Word. When the Word of God passes through our lives, it changes us, don't we? We, it, it changes us, and we become different because of, of how it affects our lives. That's why Peter said, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It's about what he's producing in us. And when we have a willing heart to grow, then God is able to begin to, to change us. And then we learn how to start acting on the word of God and really, really applying it to our lives because when it's begun to change us from the inside, it starts to come out, doesn't it? You begin to see a difference. You begin to smell the aroma. You can begin to see that there's a new flavor in somebody's life because the Word of God is truly impacting them. That's why James said in one of our memory verses, James chapter 122, don't merely listen to the Word and deceive yourself, but do what it says, you know? Just do it. Just start applying it to your life. Because the challenge for every believer is, is that all of us, as Christians, we have a private self and we have a public self, don't we? And there's a gap that exists between the two. And as we are integrating the Word of God into our lives, you know what happens? That gap begins to shrink. And those two people, they become one over a period of time. The gap gets shrunk. Because the difference between the two begins to, to evaporate. It is eliminated over a period of time. That's why Joshua said, and this was the, the mandate that God gave to Joshua before they went into battle in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. God told Joshua, do not let the word depart from your mind or your heart or your eyes. He said, you meditate on it day and night. He said, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. He said, meditate on it day and night so that you may observe to do all that is written therein. The reason you meditate on it, the reason why you internalize it is so that you'll act upon it. And he said, when you act upon it, when you observe it to do it, he said, then you'll make your way prosperous, then you'll have good success. So there comes a point in time where the rubber meets the road. We've prayed, we've read, we've studied, we've memorized, we've internalized, we're growing, we see it as the highest standard of faith and practice. You've got to then get on the playing field and just begin to do it. And that's when the integration really begins to happen because the last step in the process is then you learn to begin to trust it. You trust God's word when the circumstances are contrary. When your feelings are contrary, you know, when people's opinions are contrary to what God has said about your present and about your future, you're going to have to make a choice to either trust those opinions, to trust those circumstances, to trust those feelings, or to begin to trust and take God at his word. We build on it, we feed it, we live by it, we grow through it, we act on it, and then we ultimately learn to trust it. If you're here this morning asking the question, why and how should I trust the Bible? You need to go back to the beginning of our series and get some of those messages that establish the standard for why you can trust it. But it's real simple. God will never do you harm. God will works all things together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. You can trust God in all circumstances, in all seasons of life, no matter what life brings your way. That's why our memory verse this week and our last week, and this ends on Thursday, but really it's the beginning for us, right? Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. So if you find yourself in a dark place, and you may be wondering today, Michael, have you ever been in a dark place? Absolutely. All of us live in dark places, don't we? That's part of the journey. And if, you, and if, you, and if the person next to you or, or, or another believer tells you that they're never in a dark place, they're, they're not telling you the truth. 
because everybody lives in dark places. How do you get out of a dark place? You turn the light on. You shine the light of the Word. The revelation and the illumination of God's Word, God's Word will light up a whole new world of possibilities in your life. So when you're in that dark place and that storm comes, Sarah and Abraham were promised a child. She had great shame. God gave them a promise when they were in their 70s. The promise didn't happen for over 30 years. They dealt with the shame and the uncertainty of whether or not the promise would ever come to pass. But you know what the scripture says about Sarah in regard to the promise of God in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 says, by faith, Sarah also received strength to conceive seed when she was in a dark place, never thinking she'd be able to give birth to a child and that shame would be taken away. She was in a dark place and the scripture says she bore a child when she was past the age of childbearing because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him faithful. She not only had faith in God's promise, but more importantly, she had faith in the reliability of the one who made the promise, church. When she was in that dark place, she knew that the word of God was a sure foundation, that the promises of God were yes and amen, that they could be trusted as the highest standard of faith and practice, that there was no Shadow of turning in the creator when he declares a thing that it was 100% sure and true could be taken to the bank. And miraculously, they gave birth to the promised child, didn't they? Isaac, from which a whole spiritual and a natural race of people have come forth. The Jews in the natural and all believers in the spiritual realm have come forth from that promise. So church, when you have had bad things happen to you and bad things happen to good people, I'm here to tell you, God is faithful because he spoke it and he declared it. And when he speaks it and he declares it, it will come to pass. When you get that pink slip, God is faithful. When you get that bad diagnosis, God is faithful. When you get that unexpected phone call, God is faithful. When you fail miserably and you are yourself disappointed, God is faithful. And he will never let you down. So my question to you today is, what are you trusting God for today that only God can do? And when he does it, it'll be so obvious that it's him that only he can be glorified for it and by it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just quickly before we close our service, I want to give you an opportunity this morning because some of you have come here and you are trusting God to do something really big in your life. You're trusting God for something. You're holding on to promises today. Some of the things that I described just a few moments ago, that's you. Say, Michael, I need God to do something today. I need God's strength. I need God's perspective. I need God's word to just just change me from the inside out and to strengthen me. You're trusting God today to do something in your life. If that's you, say, Michael, pray for me. Just quickly put your hand up. Thank you for hands just going up across our gathering. Maybe you're listening online today. God wants to touch you today. You know the biggest miracle that any person can do or experience that God can do in a person's life is when you put your trust in him for your eternal salvation. If you're here this morning and and you don't have the assurance of your salvation, that you're right with God, and if this was your last day on planet Earth, that heaven is your home, if that's you, and you want to put your trust in Christ, quickly put your hand up and say, Michael, pray for me. I want to give everyone an opportunity if you've never done that. Thank you. Others, maybe you need to rededicate your life to Christ, and he's calling you back in this series. Put your hand up. I want to pray for you. You're listening online. This will be an opportunity for you as well. Okay. I'm going to pray for the first request in a moment. But those of you who said, I want to put my faith in my trust in Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. We do that by just confessing what we believe in our hearts. And we're going to make a profession of faith. And I'm going to ask you as a congregation to join me in making this profession. And especially those of you who raised your hand, God's going to do a miracle in your life. It's going to change your life. You're going to be born of the Spirit. And something is going to to happen on the inside of you. You're going to feel peace. You're going to feel forgiveness of sin. And God's going to change your life today. Let's pray that together. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm taking a step of faith today. 
to put my trust in you. I'm asking you for the peace and the assurance of my salvation. Lord, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. On the third day, you rose from the dead that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Today, I confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. I receive the gift of eternal life. In your name I pray. And Father, for all those who are trusting you, God, to move, to heal, to restore, to provide, to strengthen, whatever the need is, I ask you, God, right now, just sweep across this congregation. I pray that the breath of your spirit, Lord, would miraculously, miraculously move, Father, God, to lift each person up who raised their hands to a higher place. Those who need a miraculous touch who are listening online, God, that they would be changed. They would be, Father, transformed. As we continue in 40 days in the Word, we pray that we'd be like that that uh, tea bag, Father God, and that water, that we would be just transformed, Father, that there would be a new flavor, a new aroma in our lives today. Thank you for the power of your word, for watching over it, God, to perform what we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Let's congratulate those who made a commitment for the first time to Christ.